The message that I hope to deliver this morning is actually one that needs to be dealt with to a great extent by parents in the home concerning the children. It is a biblical message, so it can and certainly should be preached from the pulpit or taught in the classroom. But I think you'll see as we get into it why I say that it should be chief among the things that parents do in rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I suppose all of us have at times when we were growing up had someone ask us, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe it would be a plumber. Maybe it would be a carpenter or a teacher. Maybe a physician. Maybe it would be a mechanic. Maybe it would be a nurse. Maybe a lawyer or salesman. Artist. I don't know. Anything and everything is possible out there. And I, of course, limit that anything and everything in the realm of what we would even consider as legitimate ways to earn a living while we're in the flesh. There are occupations that call for high degrees of skill and much learning over a period of many years. There are those that are less demanding also. As I said earlier, we are considering the fact that one thing that we should teach in here is to choose an occupation that is, of course, acceptable to God. We may not think about it, but Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 covers that also. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. What is my Lord's interest in me regarding my choice of an occupation or as parents teaching my children the importance of an occupation? Well, that's the first part of my introduction. The other part is this. Over the years, especially since World War II and maybe even more since the 1960s, there's been a growing disposition of mind or attitude in many in the United States of getting something for nothing. Or looking for that which is free. There's nothing that's free. Somebody pays for it. Especially is that the case when it comes to the government. To a great extent, that's happened because so much teaching has gone on on socialism, to where the government, in pure socialism, owns everything, controls prices and wages and so on. Thus, they are determined through that route to pretty much make everybody equal. And of course, rank socialism is nothing but communism. You have a person who wants to be a medical doctor and is talented in that way. They go to school until maybe they're in their 30s. And here's somebody who wants to be a used car salesman, but they're all paid the exact same amount. And that's the way we can see it nowadays to what communism does by trying to say nobody's ahead of the other. Socialism is sort of a stop in between that. But what it does is that it finally ends up permeating the homes and the people. It takes generations to do it to where there's a general attitude of trying to get something for nothing or as little as possible uh, that you have to put into it. <coughs> Let me add this also. That has not been the disposition of mind of people in the United States for a long, long time until recent years where you had so many. Oh, I guess there's always been somebody that were lazy, was lazy and a bum and do all they could to just simply live off somebody else. Sort of like somebody that cheats on a test and they'd put that much work into study, they wouldn't have to cheat. 
But nevertheless, it's something that parents have an obligation to do, and it's a part of rearing their children. Learn some admonition of the Lord, study what God said about what we're to do while we're here. When Adam and Eve sinned in Eden, God set out a pattern, and Moses tells us about it. I don't know what was involved in dressing and keeping the garden which God assigned to Adam and Eve before they sinned, before sin into the world. But I do know there was a big change, a great big change. Because when they sinned, God drove them out of the garden, and he said this, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. Genesis 3.19 so something about the work that's involved, the task that's involved in doing certain things, engaged in certain occupations, is much, much different from what it was when we were sinless and we were in the garden. And I say we from the standpoint of the humanity of the time, and that was Adam and Eve. Man then is to work in order to live. One of the things that made the 19th century and early part of the 20th century so great in America was what is called in history, and you cannot study American history properly if you don't study about it, what is called the Protestant ethic. Protestant located as being taught among those who back in the 1500s forward protested the corruptions of the Roman Catholic Church and developed into the denominational world as we understand it for the last 500 years. Because there was one thing that they believed, and that was self-reliance. Individualism, carry your own weight, be responsible. Don't go out here expecting somebody else to do your part. You have a responsibility to do your part. Now that is what governed America more than people realize today who don't study anything about history or have a false sense of history or simply have had revisionist historians teach them. So when we read the Bible, we understand where some of these ideas came from because the thing about Protestantism is it formed was that the Bible had been freed and put into the hands of the common man in their own language. And people like the Puritans and the Pilgrims, they really push this individual work ethic that the Bible teaches. Now in the New Testament, the apostle writes in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, notice this, this we commanded you. The we there is the apostles. It's not a, you can if you want to. We commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. If that were applied across the board, honestly, by parents themselves and teaching their children and in who we choose to be in political office since God's blessed us where we have that choice by voting, it would change more than people can ever realize. One time, that was the case. You may not realize this. A little study of history wouldn't hurt. But if you went back, let's say, 1860, before the Civil War, the federal government had little involvement in everyday things on the local level. About the only time that the ordinary person, wherever you were in the United States, knew about the federal government was the president or some general pro um, uh, projects that were done, but not that much, maybe the army, and, and usually the post office. Now, that's just about it because the federal government was not all things to all men and designed to do everything for you. If you'll notice through the last three quarters of the 20th century, the teaching of the Bible was pretty much spurned, and the idea was we're going to make it where everybody will have everything they ever needed. 
Well, I understand the idea of helping people. I understand that. But the point is, what happened to the idea of me being taught that I'm an independent person, that I have a personal responsibility to myself and to my family and to my community to carry my own weight and to do my own thing? and not look somewhere else for somebody to dole it out to us. And by the way, in England, they talk about people without a job, they're on the dole. To the young preacher, Titus, the apostle Paul wrote, I desire that thou affirm confidently to the end that they have believed may be careful to maintain good works. Titus 3.8. Now, most of the time we read that and think about the good works of Christians in the church. And it does cover that. But in view of what the Bible teaches concerning individual responsibility and in the area of an occupation, going to work as we say it's something, it also covers that. So instead of maintaining good works, if you look in the American Standard, 1901, it'll have in the margin professed honest occupations. Because you can engage in occupations that are not honest. And there seems to be plenty of those around today. Or you can take an honest occupation and the way you deal with it make it a dishonest thing. So Christians, members of the church of Christ, children of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, while they're on this earth are to earn their food, their bread, by their own labors. Summing it up, that's God's plan. Well, you say, well, what's the Bible teaching about Christians being mindful of benevolence? Well, that's not hard to understand. Not hard at all. A person is benevolent toward a person who can't help himself. That's the idea. You can lecture to a one-legged man all day long about how to win a race. And he's not going to do it with a person in a natural who has naturally two legs and is trained in racing. He's not going to do it. I don't care how much his heart's in it. He is, and I don't care how unpolitical this is he's handicapped no fault to his own he may have lost his leg and saved somebody's life and you can do that make application that is to any part of us so naturally the church as the spiritual body of Christ looking at the life of Christ Matthew Mark Luke and John see if when he helped people who needed help But even then it didn't rule out them doing absolutely nothing. It meant they did what they could. We fail to realize that when you consider the last judgment, when each one of us stands before the judgment seat of Christ, give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, that we must understand that God who knows the hearts of all men, the motives, the plans, the purposes, He knows our abilities, and he's a perfectly just God and omniscient. Then he's not going to judge us all the same because different one of us have different talents, different abilities. But he will judge us according to our ability and accountability. But it does say, however accountable you are, he expects you to realize that and do what you can according to where you are. Now, when one becomes a Christian, as that word's defined and used in your New Testament, we recognize in the very process of conversion, a great change has taken place. It takes place repentance where we die to a practiced habitual life of sin and then being raised a new creature in Christ, our old, men, our old sin Forgiven when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. We then have put on, as Paul said to the Ephesians, the new man, Ephesians 4.24. 
And this new man, this new creature, is further described in verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, that he may have whereof to give to him that hath need. I doubt many people think about going to work to earn a living and then add on to it so I can help the person who can't help him or herself. But that's what the Bible says. That's part of good works. That's part of being faithful. That's part of what parents need to teach their children and exemplify before them. So when you're sitting down with children and you're teaching them these Bible lessons, and you're teaching them about David and Goliath, or you're teaching them about all. Think about these great lessons of teaching them self-reliance, personal responsibility, their obligation to earn a living for their own support and of their families in the future, and to be able to help those who are in need. The Christian who refuses to provide for his own household at the night the faith, and is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But even, even when one is provided for his own, his occupation, his work, and I'm emphasizing this, is to be able to provide or provide the means for him to a degree to help the needy who can't help themselves. That's obvious already. You've seen, he says, a person refuses to work. He shouldn't eat. So he can't be talking about that as far as your benevolent responsibilities as a Christian to others. We're talking about folks in legitimate need. They want to do something. They don't want to freeload, as we want to say. And, but they can't. And so you try to help them. We pray to God as we're instructed in the model prayer of Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. Well, that doesn't happen without just praying it. We see from these scriptures already that we're expected to do what is necessary to have our daily bread. We work. It's a partnership with God. And you can read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, with regards to the spiritual matters. The same principle is true of material matters. Paul was talking about preaching the gospel here, and he says, I planted, Paulus watered, God gave the increase. Well, it works that way when I'm planting my garden. You know, nobody today with all our great scientific knowledge can, can take a seed and put the germ of life in it. They can make a seed that looks just like corn or a bean seed or something, but it won't sprout. But if I'm to get the benefit of beans, <laughs> of corn, I have to cooperate with God. I have to understand that I do my part before those beans can grow properly and sprout and yield a crop. And so it is with everything that's grown. Now God provides enough. Maybe not as much as we would like, but that's the way we have to realize and do something about it. But he's taught us in Matthew 6, he will supply us with what we need if we will put him first in thought, word, and action. But many of us just don't have that much faith to take him at his word. Far too many people choose an occupation based primarily, or maybe solely, on a great income. That's all they're looking at. They're not looking at what it's going to do to their time in the church to be godly and other things. And many times they're working at jobs they don't like. Now, I recognize if you're starving to death and the job opens up and it's honest, you're going to take it to eat. So we're not just talking about that. Maybe at times it is with us, but I am talking about you can be miserable by simply choosing a job that pays a whole lot of money. 
And you don't like the job, but you like the money. I think I've heard people about say that. I don't like the job, but I like the money. I like the benefits. You ever notice how much that's talked about? Solomon wrote of this. What profit hath he that works in that wherein he laboreth? I've seen the travail, Solomon writes, which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. That's part of what he's talking about. See, people get out and just work themselves to death. Their kids are born, they grow up, and it dawns on them after a while, they're gone, and what happened? Well, you were too busy. You were too busy doing this, that, or the other. Well, I had to earn a living. Well, the main thing you had to do was rear those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and be a loving husband and father to them and take the time necessary to be with them. And we don't think that way. In Ecclesiastes 6, 6 through 11, Solomon also said the same thing. He said plainly concerning these matters, Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. All the labor of man is for his mouth. And yet, the appetite is not filled. I was reminded on YouTube the other day in an old country song of the mid-1950s. And they were all much more simple than those days. Got 20 20 vision and walking around blind. <laughs> I think that describes a whole lot of folks concerning personal responsibility, obligation to their families, obligation above all to God, and what's happening to them. And that's where the old saying, you can't see the forest where the trees comes out. He goes ahead and writes in this passage Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow. Now what a picture that draws, a word picture, of a man who spends his life in an occupation simply for what he can get out of it. Do you ever think about having an occupation? I doubt many people do. Because you enjoy it. You're happy with it. It gives you satisfaction. You feel you've accomplished something. There's fulfillment for the work that is done. I suggest that if you're going to really have a happy work life, you're going to have to think of things that way. Talked to a woman one time over 50 years ago who had a pretty hard life. Her husband was a drunk. She had to sort of shoulder the load when her kids were little, and she said, I washed clothes for other people many times in my own bathtub just to have money to put food on the table. But she said, you know, I realized that I was doing that for my children. And that just gave me great delight to know that in doing this, I had something I could do that I wasn't just left alone. It's an attitude problem that we have in America. If you cultivate an attitude of just everybody do something for me, then you'll operate in that direction. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When you study the Bible, you'll, fly, you'll find it has a great deal to say about employees and employers. Question, as an employee working for somebody else for another co company, how do you work? God directs our attention to principles which must govern our work and our state of mind, our attitudes. Now, in their day and time, he had, there were many members of the church who were slaves. We can't hardly think of that society, though in America, in the South in particular, that hasn't been that long ago, that there were slaves. In those days, it wasn't a matter of ethnicity or color of the skin, there are slaves from every direction as far as 
their ethnicity. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Then he said, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Ephesians 6, 5 through 7. Now think about that. Here is somebody who is a slave. He hears the gospel and he obeys it. And what does God, by the Holy Spirit, through the apostle, tell him regarding his work as a slave being owned by somebody else? Whatever he tells you to do, you do it as you're serving the Lord. Well, how does that translate over to us today? Well, if you're the worker, whatever you're doing, working in a machine or whatever it might be, you do it not as to just please the boss. You do it to please the real boss <laughs> as unto the Lord. So these principles that were given in the first century in the writing of the New Testament, how slaves ought to deal with their position, and then he will do the same thing concerning masters owning those slaves have to do with us today of our work ethic. When I work for somebody else, Paul is saying, perform those duties as if you're serving Christ. Don't just do it because, well, the boss is uh, looking at me now. I've got to look like I'm working. He's not looking at me. I won't do much. That's wrong. That's men pleasers. So as regards our occupation, this means that our work for an employer is really a work for ourself in the sense that as Christians we're doing it as the Lord would have our put our heart and our work into it. It's part of our Christian living. Now notice what he said about masters. And ye masters do these same things unto them. He said, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven, Ephesians 6, 9, Colossians 4, 1. You say there's no slavery today. Listen, every faithful child of God is a slave to Jesus Christ by his or her own choice. It's his will that's to be done, not my own. It's his will that's to be done not the will of my parents when they want me to do things contrary to the teaching of the Bible. It's His will that's to be done in every aspect of life. And we must keep it that way. When you think of salaries that are paid, the golden rule satisfies all that. You've heard of these strikes lately. Well, I grew up with hearing about strikes and long before I came on here, striking for more pay, better working conditions, better benefits, all that kind of thing. If those who owned businesses would simply follow this one thing, what we call the golden rule, there wouldn't be any labor unions. Not a one of them. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat the employees as you would want to be treated. That is, as your roles are reversed. That doesn't happen. In the big corporations, you may bring them in millions and millions of dollars for 20 years, but the year or the month, you don't bring them in that money you've done for 20 years. You're gone because you're there. Remember, a corporation exists to make money, and if you can't make it money, you're gone. Now, you may like your corporation or whatever it is. That's fine, but if you can't make them money, you will not be a part of that. That thing has its own existence, a corporate body. And the people that run it, run it to make money for the people who own it, the stockholders. you got to understand that. Listen to this. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Then he goes ahead to say, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped in your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. 
And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Now James wrote that to Christians in James 5, verses 1 through 5. Not written to people outside the church or heathens. He's saying this is part of what you need to understand about being a Christian who owns a business or have people that work for them. Every employer needs to be reminded. Know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9. So you see there's the right treatment of the employee by the employers and vice versa. We do it as unto the Lord, whether you're an employer or an employee. All of that would change if everybody would follow the teachings of Christ, becoming Christians. Now, understand, I'm speaking to a very small minute bunch of people called Christians, as the Bible defines and uses that term. So you can't expect that from the heathens, although sometimes I have seen people who seem to care nothing about Christianity treat people better than some members of the church. But that's not the fault of God or the Bible. That's because those members of the church I just mentioned wouldn't follow the truth themselves, and they needed what James had to write. And that's the reason James wrote it to Christians. Do you have any questions about occupations? Well, in the home is a time when children, especially hit, hit their teenage years, start thinking about things like this. Notice what we read in Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more. Now think of all the ways you can talk about, discuss with your children how you can steal from somebody. That's taking from somebody what does not belong to you. Now think of all the forms that can take. I can't cover it here now. But if you want to have instruction, we talk about homeschooling. Well, this needs to be a part of it. When I was in school, we had uh, one semester in the ninth grade of civics. We didn't have that anymore. But then we had a semester called occupations. And we talked about all these things. I don't know whatever happened to that either. But we talked about just exactly what we're talking about here. Now, it wasn't taught altogether from what the Bible had to say, but it was taught altogether of you're being responsible, choosing a proper occupation, thinking about your life ahead, and all of this. So if a job calls for dishonesty, you may lose your job, but you shun it. You think of all these things in the government that people are being charged with besides just the politics of it, right and left. Why, they're thieves in the government. Is that a revelation to you? There are thieves in Walmart. Look up sometime and see how much, how many millions of dollars Walmart, just Walmart alone, loses every year from employee theft. All that could be stopped by simply doing what God said. And of course, you know who it's passed on to. Whatever they've lost is going to be passed on the prices that they charge for things. We're taught to provide things honest in the sight of all men. We must be mindful of how we appear to others, what we're doing. Even in matters of good, better, best, we must be mindful of the example it sets before the unbeliever. We're to maintain honest occupations, Titus 3 and verse 8. It comes down to this. If you can't be honest and continue your occupation, the occupation has to go. You have to change occupations. Yeah, but I make so much money at this, I couldn't make this any other place. Well, see how that works when you stand before the Lord in judgment. Life's too short and eternity too long. It's unending as to jeopardize my salvation. Is it honorable what we do? Study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your hands, even as we charge you that ye may walk becomingly toward them that are without. First Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12. Sometimes we don't realize reading this, he's addressing things that we don't address that much in teaching about living the Christian life. In our, in our jobs, as in all matters, we should provide things then honest in the sight of all men. 
2 Corinthians 8, 21. Of course, the attitude, what's true and what's honorable and what's just and what's pure, is the job I'm in allowing me to do these things, to have these attitudes. If I could honestly be a bartender, could I ever honorably be a bartender? I want to add this to it because it just dawned on me. Some years ago, a woman attended here for a while, a few weeks. And then she asked, very nice lady, dressed real well. Then she asked if she could meet with me, which I did. I met with her in the library. And she wanted me to perform her marriage ceremony. In the process, we discussed some things there because I really didn't know her, but meeting her here. She had an earned degree, and I've forgotten from which university. I want to say Texas A&M. I'm not sure. In business economics or something like that. But she couldn't find a job in her field. She was bartending. And the reason she came usually on Sunday afternoon when she did come here a few weeks was because she had stepped two or three o'clock in the morning on Saturday night closing up the bar, and she had to sleep and couldn't get up and be here. She wanted me to do that. She wanted me to have part in as a preacher. I don't know what kind of background she had. But she brought her husband-to-be to meet with us. We had quite a long visit. We ended up, of course, talking about uh, what is it to be faithful, what constitutes faithfulness, what constitutes sin. Uh, he had no idea. He just, well, uh, you know, be looking at the clock and wondering what it is. Uh, just to see them, well, they were dressed well, they looked well. But she saw no problem with her doing what she was doing. Until she, and her very statement was, well, it makes better money I can find in my whatever. I said, I'm sorry, but if I know my Bible and it's there, what I would do and when I sit down with them, I'd find passages and said, read that to me. You know that's the Bible of the world. I'd read that to me and tell me what it says. I would not tell them what it said. I would have them read the scripture to me and they explain to me what it said. And they condemn themselves out of their own mouth. Well, she did. He didn't. He was there because she wanted him there. I just said, I, I can't have a part of this. In fact, I'll just tell you right now, in view of what you've read and what you understood and you've explained to me, you're not even faithful to the Lord. Well, that ended that. Now, from my standpoint as a Christian, as a preacher, how could I do less? But I can think of some preachers and some people that say, well, here's some more we can add to us and she can give us some of that money she's getting for bartending. <laughs> we need the money. That's the way people think. But I could never honorably do that, and no Christian should be able honorably to do these things. You couldn't have authority from God to do it. You can't be a part of anything that's wrong. There are two other, three other questions I'd like to ask, but time's getting away from us, but I will point them out here. Does it hinder spirituality? And I'll just simply tack on here a very important point. You hear a lot around here, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I've known of good brethren who refused to take lucrative jobs in different places because of what it would do to their demand on their time and away from their family and what they couldn't be in, in the church. And I admire people like that. Then, too, I'll add this, does it provide satisfaction? I've touched on that already. In, our, in other words, your occupation ought to be far more than just a means to a living. After Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he then got down, and he's talking about living in this world, and he tells us that we are not to be anxious for the morrow, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, Matthew 6, 33 through 34. What is that saying? If you put God first, if you spend your time loving His will and doing it and being what you ought to be as a person, whether it's a man or a woman, father or mother, child, God will see that you get what you need. He will guide you. It just takes faith on our part. And yet He says it, and all these things shall be added unto you. How are you going to speak against that? 
Jesus says, you do that which ought to come first in your life. And all these things shall be added unto you. So, you know, that's what about fifth grade English as it's translated. It's not a problem of understanding it. The problem is we just don't believe it. Well, as we bring the lesson to a close, I hope you see why this type of study needs to have a lot of study in the home. And it ought to be incorporated in the curriculum of all those who train their children at home as to what it is to be a godly person and about godly things. Now, this was primarily given to those who are members of the church of our Lord, who are genuine, true Christians. A person must become a Christian to be a new creature in Christ. To be in Christ, to be baptized into Christ. Who? The person that believes in Christ, repents of sins, confesses their faith in Christ. The only doorway into God's church is to be baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ, Galatians 3.27. There's no other doorway. So you can't begin to do these things till you believe the truth about the plan of salvation and that the gospel is God's power to save you from sin, Romans 1, verse 16. The child of God, of course, are you living faithful? There's room to grow in these areas. Imagine these people back in the first century coming out of what they did and these slaves who were faithful. Imagine how they labored to bring their life into harmony with God's will. Well, that's growing up in Christ. But you've got to be in Christ to grow up in Christ and to be faithful to Him. And that's why obeying the gospel is so important. If you've sinned as a child of God, you need to repent, confess those sins, and pray for forgiveness. And once again, be faithful to Him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.